First up, well, I don't know if it, he was the first to post, but uh, <laughs> when I look at the comments in the behind the scenes page, uh, YouTube studio page, Jim D's comment comes up first. Jim D is the podcaster, the voice behind Attack Ads, exclamation point. A, uh, a very enjoyable podcast. And Jim and I will be talking tomorrow via Zoom for my podcast, the Seabrom Vault podcast, about a book that we have both read. Well, I'll put read in scare quotes there. He's actually read it and taken careful notes. I've listened to the audiobook repeatedly. But the book is The Tyranny of Merit, What's Become of the Common Good by Michael J. Sandel. So Jim and I are going to have a conversation about that tomorrow afternoon, and I hope to get it up on the Sea Realm Vault RSS later that day. But in response to my video, Jim wrote, Have you read Daniel Pink's book, Drive? All the research on employment, i.e. doing a task for direct remuneration or the possibility of a prize, shows that people get dumber when they are paid to do it. It's a double whammy. You start to do what you love, but you hate doing it after a while because it makes you dumber doing it. Meaning, if you're a smart person, the specter of pay shines down upon your employment opportunities with a blazing sun of searing stupid. Somehow, I suspected that long enough ago that I have, for years, worked jobs that take very little braining when on task. That way, I can daydream myself into a stupor and still get paid and, and put all the thinky cap fun into projects that don't pay a penny. And yeah, Jim, I mean, that's, that's pretty much what I relayed in that video is that, um, you know, for me, the days that I was investing the most <laughs> into the C-Realm podcast and, you know, related projects was in those days when I was working in insurance or working customer service tech support at Comcast. You know, in those instances, even though I was making some money with the podcast, the podcast was really the way that I was, you know, it was where I was putting my real energies. You know, as if to say, this thing that I do for money, that I do during the day, I do under protest. Here's my real work. And then when my real work generated enough income that I didn't have to have the day job anymore, well, I started to resent that too. But at 53 years of age, it is too late for me to go back and be just a good worker bee. You know, I just don't have the time. Really, I'm committed to this path. So the video starts out with me talking about the uh, Scarlett Johansson lawsuit against Disney because her contract guaranteed her a certain amount of revenue based on box office performance. And, you know, they put the, the movie Black Widow on the streaming service at the same time that it opened in theaters. Obviously, that's going to take away from the actual box office draw, which is just taking money out of Scarlett Johansson's pocket. But <sighs> Scarlett Johansson, what do you think Scarlett Johansson's net worth is? Would you have guessed $165 million? Are you really crying that Scarlett Johansson is going to miss out on a $10, $20, 30000000 million payday when she got a base $20 million for you know, reading her lines and, and hitting her marks in Black Widow? And I haven't seen the film, you know, and I'm, I like Scarlett Johansson generally, and I really like her as an actress. I want to see her in more stuff, but at the same time, if you've got $165 million, well, good for you. You can do whatever the fuck you want. You don't need any more money. You don't have to do movies because they pay you a lot of money. You can do movies that are good movies because you, will, you think they will be good movies and you want to be a part of that. You don't need any more money, Scarlett Johansson. You have enough money. But Jess disagrees. Jess writes, see, I disagree. And I'm not sure why people seem to view Scarlett Johansson as so unsympathetic. Again, I like her. I like her as an actress. I don't know her as a person, but I get the impression that she's a decent person. Anyway, Jess writes, I don't care how much her base pay is. This is ultimately a contract dispute between management and labor. By default, I side with labor. This reminds me of sports contracts, of sports contract negotiations, where we see messaging about rich, greedy players. But I'm like, nah, it's still a labor dispute. Disney signed a contract with their talent. If they felt that COVID realities meant that the contract wasn't viable anymore, they should have fucking renegotiated with talent. Last point, if Disney thinks they can screw over ScarJo, how much are they going to screw the little guys? Okay, first I'll say, yeah, if you're going to phrase it as labor versus management, I'm, I'm always on the side of labor. And if you're going to talk about, you know, Disney as some evil, malevolent 
screwer of employees. Well, I've honestly in my, you know, my own life, I only know one person who ever worked for Disney and he did very well by his time at Disney. You know, he worked for them. I don't know exactly how many years, but, you know, later in his career and uh, he retired and he has, you know, a severance package and uh, retirement benefits from Disney, which are pretty generous. But, you know, that could be a generational thing. He's a boomer. A Zoomer starting at Disney today, you know, entry level, yeah, is probably going to get treated like a machine, which is to say useful, but disposable and deserving of no consideration once they're no longer of use. But yeah, put it, put it in terms of labor versus management, and I'm on team labor. Ben Rubber writes, makes me wonder about Richard Henea's idea that companies or institutions tend to get more liberal over time. It was a big few articles that I never read, thinking maybe that's not what he meant to write. But anyway, have you? He was on Rising when it was with Crystal and Sagar a bit ago, I think. So let me just pause here and say, you know, I looked up uh, Richard Hananiah's website, and uh, it basically gives a very brief, you know, CV and then a message that says this, this web page will no longer be updated. If you want new stuff, go to my, my medium.com page. I went to his medium.com page. You, you can't read anything there unless you subscribe. And even if you subscribe at the no donation, you know, no dollar a year level, they still want a credit card number. So fuck that. <laughs> and fuck Richard Hananea or whatever his name is. I mean, maybe he's a lovely person with grand insights. But if you need a credit card for me to even see, you know, your initial first blush, you know, your hot takes, well, good luck to you, sir. <laughs> Whatever victories you achieve in life, they will not be funded by my dollars. Ben Robert continues, I'm most interested in the Goliath lynching porn aspect of it, but it's indeed similarly lame to athletes fighting for additional millions on top of their astronomic income. So also in the video, I talked about my, my inability sometimes to uh, drag myself to the drawing board to do what, you know, would have been a dream job for me in my teens or 20s drawing comics. You, you're getting paid to draw comics. Why aren't you doing it all day, every day? Why do you treat it like a chore that you attend to begrudgingly? To which Ben Rubber writes, I have very similar willpower rationality to this. I found myself jumping from interest to interest over the post-schooling, regular working part of my life. One eventually finds mundane aspects in every new interest, I've been convinced that I have a character deficiency and that I don't stick with things and properly specialize and strive for perfection. So Ben Rubber, let me just point out that you're interpreting this tendency of yours as a character defect. Well, it's only a defect in the context of an economic landscape, which is replete with hyper-specialization. If you are averse to hyper-specialization, well, you know, in, in terms of evolution, that's a boon. That's good, because over-specialization is death. So what, what is it? Uh, is it Alan Watts? Who said that, you know, being well-adjusted to uh, an insane society is, you know, is not sanity. Resisting the pressure to over-specialize is a very sane, you know, and, and practical urge. It's a very practical impulse. To my mind, it is a perverted and just really out of whack society that would include, you know, the resistance to over-specialization over in the broader set of defects, either character defects or personality defects or social defects, because you're supposed to hyper-specialize, man. Ben Rubber concludes with, I'm content enough to maintain a healthy level of self-esteem and refrain from beating up on myself too much. I resolved to return to previous interests now and then, but the learning process or the novelty of learning new stuff pulls more than the prefrontal cortex's demand to stick to something and perfect it. So toward the end of the video, uh, I basically went on a, <laughs> a little rant saying, nothing matters. You know, pull back. If you're really focused on yourself, your life, your accomplishments, how much money you made, how much you owe to others, how much others have failed you in moments of need, how much you have fallen down in moments of crisis, if all that is central, you know, to your thinking, just pull back, pull back in time, pull back to don't, don't think about one, two, five, 10 year intervals. Think about million year intervals. What's happening in those intervals? 
You know, if, if over the course of a day you travel a matter of miles, well, think about what's happening in a, a matter of light years from where you're sitting right now. To which Anthony responded, What we do may not matter much in the grand scheme of things, but what we do does matter in the lives of those with whom ours are interwoven. It also matters because our actions determine, to a large extent anyway, the quality of life we're going to have over the span of a lifetime. That's not insignificant to us. So yeah, I mean, you are the hero of your own story. You are the point of view character. You know, yours is the central and privileged focus of your existence. So yeah, you know, from the perspective of the person sitting behind your eyes, what's happening right now in your social network, among the people that you know and care about, you know, your actions will have effects on those people that you will have to live with. And it's pretty important. I agree. Rob writes, As obscene as action stars' earnings are relative to the average wage earner, I'd much rather see actors pocketing our cash than studio execs. Same with professional sports and the athletes versus owners. Profit sharing would be mandatory, in my view, from a moral standpoint. Really enjoyed Black Panther, Endgame, Doctor Strange, WandaVision, and Loki. Those last two being uh, TV series on Disney+. Plus. Never a big fan of the Black Widow, Ant-Man, or Captain America. Some of the Avengers are just more compelling than others to me. And I'll, I'll just stop there and say, you know, I, I'm a particular kind of film buff. I really like superhero stuff. I really like science fiction. I like the fantastic. But, you know, I've also done a lot of reading and I... I aspire to be a storyteller myself, and I understand certain things about what makes for good storytelling and what makes for bad storytelling. And the movie Black Panther was replete with very bad storytelling, mostly as relates to the character of T'Challa. T'Challa, a.k.a. you know Black Panther, the character played by Chadwick Boseman, the late and much missed Chadwick Boseman. In Captain America Civil War, he had a decent character arc. His father was alive at the beginning of the film. His father was killed in a bombing that was laid at the feet of the Winter Soldier, a.k.a. Bucky Barnes. And T'Challa was torn between, you know, his his duty as the new king and, you know, the, the new monarch and the head of state and as a son who just lost his father, but who happens to have superpowers, you know? So he wants revenge. And at first, his need for revenge just seems like straightforward justice, and he freaking goes for it. You know, and we get to see Black Panther doing his thing and being powerful, but then he learns more about the situation. And the more he learns, the more conflicted he becomes until toward the end of, you know, the the story, he has completely changed roles. He's now the person who's talking sense, dispensing forgiveness, you know, he's got a genuine character arc in that film. He's a good, he's a well-written, well-developed, well portrayed character in Captain America Civil War. In Black Panther, he's he's an NPC. He's nothing. He has no arc. He doesn't he doesn't go anywhere. I mean, you can say that by the very end, he has softened a little bit on his father's stance that Wakanda being the recipient, the undeserving recipient of a gift, a literal gift from heaven, a meteorite of magic metal falls into their country, and what do they do with it? They take it, they develop lots of high-tech perks for themselves, which they don't share with any of their neighbors to the point where they even hide their wealth and, you know, their, their high standard of living behind holograms. They pretend to be a broke third world, you know, supposedly developing nation when in fact they're the richest country on earth. They have the higher standard of living on earth and they don't share with anybody. And by the end T'Challa has softened up a little bit on that to say, you know what, let's throw a few dollars at poor black kids in Oakland. Fuck that. I mean, this this is Marvel going too far in the direction of, hey, let's have sympathetic villains. Because Killmonger was just clearly correct. He had the correct point of view in terms of how Wakanda is behaving, given its astounding nearly unmeasurable, but also absolutely undeserved boon that it got. And it didn't share with anybody. You know, you you had to push him to an extreme, you know, an absurd extreme where he was going to push too hard on the violent retribution 
you know, solution to the Wakanda problem. But you really had to push him to, you know, the writers had to push him to extreme lengths in that direction to make his, his solid social critique into a flaw, you know, into a villain, a super villain. You know, I agree. It, it had great production design, costume design, all that stuff. Mwah. Writing, garbage. As for WandaVision and, WandaVision and Loki, and he didn't mention um, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, so I don't know where that plays in, but you know that was that was between WandaVision and Loki in terms of the uh, Disney Plus cinematic, you know, Marvel Cinematic Universe and the small screen rollout. WandaVision, it was quirky, it was interesting. I kind of enjoyed the uh, you know the tour through television history. Pretty flawed in terms of a freestanding story, but you know people have worked it to death on YouTube. I'm, I'm not going to say anything more about it, other than what I said and I think I said in writing, maybe not. That you know my favorite aspect of uh, WandaVision were the the three sort of uh, secondary or even tertiary characters from other movies that all came together in this one. Uh, they being Monica Rambeau, who was played by a child actress in um, Captain Marvel. Um, Darcy, I don't remember Darcy's last name, but she was Jane Foster's sidekick in the first two Thor movies, you know, Jane Foster being the uh, Natalie Portman character. And also uh, Jimmy Woo. He's an FBI agent and he was an Ant-Man, maybe an Ant-Man and the Wasp, I mostly remember him in Ant-Man. And, you know, they, these are three characters who were not really worth considering on their own. You know, you, you'd never call for a, a Darcy standalone film. And yet the three of them together working, you know, outside the system, like as, as sort of marginalized elements of the system, but, you know, banding together to form a sort of freestanding power structure or freestanding, you know, point of agency outside of the larger agency for which or agencies for which they worked. I, you know, that trio just really worked for me. And I, I don't know if that was a brainstorm or if it was just, you know, accidental magical chemistry, but I liked, <laughs> I liked those three characters working together. Falcon and Winter Soldier, uh, I, I don't have much to say about that other than the pandemic really screwed them over. There apparently was a pandemic storyline, which they had to edit out, which made for some bizarre pacing issues. And I think they ended up having to use every second of Anthony Mackie and Sebastian Shaw footage that they shot. And some of it was just junk, you know, <laughs> and just the, the preachy woke bits. It's like, ugh. No, I really like Anthony Mackie. He's, he's a good actor. Lots of good actors in these things, and they do the best with what they're given. So no criticism whatsoever to the actors. It's all in the writing, and, you know, I think the writers are hamstrung from the get-go by the studio execs and the producers who have a particular message. They think, they think that genre franchises that are beloved by men in their 40s and 50s absolutely have to be the vehicle for this woke messaging, which denigrates men, you know, particularly white men in their middle age. How is that supposed to make money? How is that supposed to be a money-making formula? I just don't get it. But you know what? I, I just write that off as defective mentality that will cost studios billions of dollars, you know, once all accounts are totaled. But so what? They've got plenty of money. They can waste billions of dollars if they care to and, you know, squander decades worth of goodwill <laughs> with their customers. It's their business to run into the ground and let them do it. And finally, Loki, you know, the Loki series, uh, you know, the, the showrunner was a writer from Rick and Morty, and it clearly shows. Marvel has pinched multiple writers from the, the Rick and Morty writer's room. And what people with that caliber of imagination can do over at Disney, you know, in terms of spectacle, yeah, it's a lot bigger than what they can do at Cartoon Network. But in terms of communicating something fun, you know, of, of flexing their imaginative muscles, they're really hamstrung over at Disney. You know, they're, they're accepting a, a level of constraint that they probably didn't understand when they were getting into, or maybe there's just enough, enough digits on that paycheck that imagination, integrity, fuck them. <laughs> I'm getting paid. Rob continues, a couple of years back, I'd resolved to do a three-day fast at the turn of every season. Managed a couple of times, but wasn't able to keep it up with all of life's complexities. Intermittent fasting comes very easy once I set the intention and the weight drops pretty easily and consistently once I get into that mode. I do actually enjoy long fasts in the same way I enjoy meditation retreats. Just neither vibes very well with the rest of my life at present. Self-help can definitely become a distraction and another form of procrastination. I think part of it 
is that you can take a deep, penetrating, and uncomfortable insight and scale it back into an easier to digest but shallower truth, and it will be more popular. People will get the hint of the deeper aspect and feel that resonance, but not get the full dose of the wisdom. The popularity of the secret is coming to mind. So, you know, I had, um, I said something similar recently about psychedelics, that psychedelics hint at something really super profound, but when you try to cash it out into normal human language, it, you're just not capturing what you experienced under the psychedelics. And that's fine. I mean, it's fine that, you know, you've been given this realization that there's something else, something more, something beyond what is presented to you, you know, as what's important. That's great. The problem is when you think the answer is to be obtained by taking more psychedelics. And if you get a little more hint of that deeper mystery, but not the full understanding, well, then you go back to the well of psychedelics and you take more. And I think that people get into a problem where, you know, when they're going back to the well so often, just regularly going back to the well, they're not giving themselves time to process the messages they've already been given. You know, if, if there are messages, if there's a giver and there's a message to be given, you know, if that's the case, they haven't taken sufficient time to process it. And every time you go back to that psychedelic well, you know, for another dose, you're also pushing yourself further away from consensus reality. And you might think that consensus reality is slavery, but at the same time, consensus reality is what keeps the planes flying, you know? So just operating from a perspective that is far divorced from mainstream consensus reality doesn't mean that you're, you know, working at some superior level, <laughs> not by any stretch. Most heresy is wrong. Yeah, the, you know, the privileged established worldview might have some fatal flaws, but just because you disagree with it in some place or another doesn't mean that you are right. In fact, chances are you are wrong. Chances are consensus reality is right in the place where you disagree with it. On the topic of fasting, Intermittent fasting, uh, UBK, writes, I found the 5 slash 19 diet quite free of difficulty for the most part. I mean, one is asleep for much of it. Usually, and deferring a first meal turns out to be good for mood and energy levels in the morning for me. It's crazy how quickly it had an effect. I wasn't super overweight, but I think it was visibly transformative even to acquaintances within a few weeks. And I think I look like a different person now. Yeah, it's, it's amazing what, you know, taking 15 pounds off will do for your face. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty amazing. And then uh, UBK has a postscript, which is to say, who'd have thought some dubious crank fad would actually work? <laughs> so SM writes, Black Panther actually was a great movie, much better than the first two Thor movies and the third Iron Man movie. Don't agree with you there. All right, well, you know... Let's think back to the first Thor movie. It was directed by Kenneth Branagh. And you can, you can really see it in the opening scenes, particularly when they're in Asgard. You know, and it's Anthony Hopkins as Odin there, passing the mantle to his son, Thor. You know, it's... You can just really see the voice of the director on screen there. And then we, we morph into the Marvel disease, where you get action set pieces which have already been choreographed and pre before the director is even selected. When the action starts, the director is, is removed, you know, and it is turned over to, you know, a, a second unit director who's really the action director. I mean, you really see this in Black Panther. I mean, this is super on display in Black, Black Panther, even though uh, the director, Ryan Coogler, he directed uh, Creed and Creed Two, which is what, uh, you know, Rocky Seven VII and Eight. These are boxing films. You know, these are films with action in them. Conceivably, you know, presumably he's got some facility with action sequences. But, you know, for Marvel CGI extravaganza battle set pieces and the, the last third of their films, you know, the, the director, whoever they've selected. And clearly, you know, the director of Black Panther in 2018, 2019, whatever it came out, was not going to be a white guy, <laughs> you know. But whatever person they chose to helm the film was going to have the support, you know, you can put support in scare quotes if you want, of lots of very experienced, talented, proven white men to do the heavy lifting in places where Mr. Kugler might not have a whole lot of experience, like in orchestrating ridiculous CGI battles with hundreds of participants, some of them riding rhinoceroses. 
I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, but Black Panther is everything that is wrong with Marvel movies, even though Brie Larson doesn't appear in it. <laughs> I mean, that would be the only thing to make it worse if, if somehow they could work in a Brie Larson cameo. But otherwise, it's not the worst. I mean, SM here is definitely is on the right track picking on Thor and Thor 2. I mean, Thor the Dark World, that one was really lame. And the third Iron Man movie, you know, that was written and directed by Shane Black. And I saw it in the theater and it, it just came and went. I didn't think a thing about it, didn't care. It was nothing special. But then I think I was in a hotel room a year or so ago. And, you know, it, being in a hotel room is the only place where I'm ever coming into a story not at the beginning. Because most everything that I watch is streaming. But if I'm at a hotel, you know, I might just be flipping through channels. That's the only place I channel surf. And I'm, for some reason, I caught the last third of Iron Man 3 a couple of years ago. And it was much better than I remember it being. It was snappy. I mean, the dialogue was good. Um, I, I just liked it. I mean, it really was working for me. I have not gone back and rewatched the whole movie, though. <laughs> But SM, who uh, seems to have seen the Black Widow film, which I haven't, concludes with, but Black Widow wasn't as good, and I actually stopped watching it about an hour in. Glad I wasn't stuck in a movie theater. Again, haven't seen the film, can't comment on it, and I won't comment on it. <laughs> Next. Google's Creepy Nanya writes, I suspect there is an unseen part of you that cares what you do. Just to be clear, I'm talking about something non-physical. So, yeah, you know, maybe I got off on a rant that's like, uh, in the grand scheme of things, nothing matters. In 100 years, who's going to care? You know, to quote uh, Sarah Connor's roommate and co-worker in the first Terminator film. And, you know, that rant is, is self-consistent and it's consistent with, you know, one particular point of view that I sometimes inhabit. But I am vast. I contain multitudes. I will sometimes contradict myself. I'm not committed to that, you know, nothing matters viewpoint. It's just that if you shift your perspective you know, to a very vast one or to a transpersonal perspective, it's often a lot easier to take all the bullshit of daily life. Creepy's Nanya also posted, I remember a Calvin and Hobbes comic where Calvin was talking about writing a self-help book to cure people of their addiction to self-help books. I think the title option was How to Stop Whining and Get a Life. Ed writes, I too struggle with procrastination. One approach that has worked for me is to obtain a good understanding of what it is I truly want. I have found that it is easy to find the motivation to pursue the satisfaction of those genuine, deeply felt desires. Well, Ed, I gave your, your comment the heart there. Um, I, I don't really have anything to say in response to it. And that's a bummer, because that's the last comment, possibly the first comment, I think I was reading them in reverse order, to this particular video. Thanks to everybody who commented, because, you know, for me, the comments are really where it's the real reward that I get from this and these sorts of videos. I mean, if I didn't script it, if there's not a lot of editing that went into it, I don't monetize it. I'm not getting paid for this. And in fact, it's, it's largely a, uh, a form of procrastination. You know, if I'm doing this, I'm not doing the things that I actually do get paid to do. So, um, you are under no obligation to reinforce this behavior, but if you want to, it's comments that really, you know, thoughtful comments that really uh, reinforce me taking the time to shoot, but more importantly, edit and upload these videos. Anyway, thanks for watching. Uh, keep commenting, and I will keep responding to your comments. Stay